Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to today's, today's seminar on culture and the climate crisis. My name is Kirsten Lloyd and I'm a lecturer in the School of Art History at the University of Edinburgh. And I've organised this event um, together with Rachel Harkness, to give us a wave, Rachel, if you're there, um, from the School of Design, Alex Smith from Museum Gallery Scotland, and Natasa Filmonis, also from the University of Edinburgh. And the purpose of today's event is really to bring together museum workers, students, doctoral researchers around this core question, which is what does a climate conscious culture sector look like and how do we get there? And it's been designed to really bridge and bring together three programmes. Um, firstly, the Scottish Graduate School of Arts and Humanities Cultural and Museum Studies Discipline Catalyst, uh, which is quite a mouthful, but um, this is a, a group of um, academics who come together to try and offer an annual training programme to doctoral students across Scottish universities, which addresses the key debates and methods in the field today. So we normally run three events per year. And the questions that really drive our development of these events are, what is culture? How do we shape and engage with it? What does innovation look like in a cultural context? How can we build more accessible, inclusive and transformational ways of thinking and working in cultural settings? So I think you can see there clearly how this question of the climate crisis and how it impacts on the sector really fits in well with those driving questions that underpin our work. Our second partner is Museum Gallery Scotland, which Alex is going to discuss shortly. And thirdly, we have the Masters by Research programme in Collections and Curating Practices here at the University of Edinburgh, which is a programme that I direct and my students are here this morning as well. So good morning to you as well. So in terms of the schedule, um, that should appear on your screen just now. So we have a packed schedule and we've tried to sort of really um, work around Zoom fatigue by scheduling in breaks, lots of questions and answers and breakout rooms and also short presentations of around 10 to 15 minutes. So we've got five speakers today and as I've said there's plenty of opportunity for open discussion but we've really tried to aim for a mixture of theory, strategic vision, and on the ground perspectives through looking at very specific case studies as well. So we've got a break at 10.15 for 15 minutes, um, and then we're planning to finish at around 12.15. So it's a short but sweet event, but we've got a lot to pack in before then. So in terms of how the event will run, we're going to be recording the event and then we'll be editing out just the presentations, so not the discussion, just the presentations will come out and we'll upload the presentations to the Scottish Graduate School of Arts and Humanities YouTube channel so that future, future doctoral students can actually engage with these ideas. Um, we're going to ask everyone to keep their microphones on mute and less speaking. If you want live captions for this event, there's a button at the bottom of your screen, which says live captioning, which you can press and hopefully that will generate the live captions that Zoom generates. Um, if you want to ask questions, please just pop them in the chat or you can of course unmute your mic and um, raise your hand and unmute your mic during the Q&A sessions as well. Um, we've got breaks scheduled, as I've said, but it's also really important, I think, that you feel free to look away from the screen, to get up and down and to move around the room. Um, as I say, I think we're all very familiar with this type of event now, but it's important to just remember how important movement is um, to our engagement with some of the, to, with our engagement with ideas. The breakout rooms have been added because we know how much harder it is to exchange ideas and to participate in discussion and, and indeed to meet people in an online environment in, in this sort of COVID era. And previous events have taught us that breakout rooms are a really good way of just getting together small groups of people of between four and five and offering a really informal opportunity to meet other attendees and to share your research experiences and thinking or just things that come to have brought, been brought to your mind over the course of the day. So there's no need to prepare anything. This is These are just short breakout rooms of around 20 minutes and it'll just give you a chance to meet other people who are working or interested in this area. And then towards the end of the session as well, 
we're going to um, just pop a link in the in the chat and invite you to do an online evaluation questionnaire. It'll take around three minutes, I think, to complete. But it would really help us just to understand who our audience is, what you're interested in, and what you think might have been able to what worked well and what might have worked better with this event. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to hand over now, I'll stop sharing, I'm just going to hand over now to Alex Smith, who's just going to offer a very brief introduction um, to Museum Gallery Scotland, and he'll come back and talk to us later in the session as well to give us a fuller account of their work. So Alex, can I hand over to you? Yeah, of course. Thanks for that, Kirsten. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so yes, yeah, so as was said, I'm, my name's Alex Smith. I'm the Climate Officer for Museums Gallery Scotland. Um, and I'm delighted to be joining this event today. Um, so Museums Gallery Scotland, or, or MGS, is the development body for Scotland's museum sector. Um, we are lucky enough to work with, with over 400 museums um, across the whole of Scotland. And, and these range from, from the big nationals down to, to very small organisations with maybe one or two team members um, and cover a range of, a range of topics. Um, we provide um, advice, advocacy, um, sector and organisation development, accreditation services, and, and most popularly, probably grants as well, along with a, a lot of other stuff. Um, over the past year, this remit has, has started to involve climate and sustainability work, um, which is what I'm here to talk to you about later on and kind of the role that museums can play in that. Um, this initially came from this, this need for, for climate change and sustainability work came from a mix of, of both our own organisational principles, um, but also from a, a real kind of groundswell of activity from the bottom up from within museums themselves and wanting to do this and wanting to get involved. Um, so it's a, it's a very exciting time for the sector um, and I'm really looking forward to today. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Alex. And then we have Claire Squires here, who is the director of the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities, or SAGS as I call it for short, but um, Claire, do you want to just tell us a bit about um, the work that you're doing in this area? Yeah, definitely. Um, and thanks so much, Kirsten, colleagues um, and speakers and participants for putting this great event together. Unfortunately, I can't stay all morning, so it's delightful to know that you're recording and I'll be able to watch back. Um, yeah, so um, one of the priorities certainly that I had when I started as director at SAGSA um, back in January 22 was to think about climate crisis and sustainability. Um, and so it's it's kind of both natural and uh, really good to see our discipline as catalysts putting events together like this so again thanks to the organizers for for doing it um a couple of areas of work um just for those of you who perhaps will be less aware of um the scottish graduate school um of arts for arts and humanities and what we do we've actually just published our strategy and operations plan i'll put a link in the chat for anyone who's interested in taking a look at it it's the first time that we've done this and it's it's very much a work in progress and i know that it's not enough um, uh, so any kind of feedback um, on our directions of travel um, and what we're doing would be always uh, strongly appreciated. It's both thinking through very practical issues about, for example, how we run our events, um, what our responsibilities are in terms of, for example, funding travel for our funded PhD researchers, those sorts of things, but also very much thinking about, and I know this session will, will very much do this as well, thinking about, you know, kind of what intellectual leadership looks like as well, um, coming from the cultural sector, coming from the arts and humanities. That's that's really crucial. It's not just operational. Um, so I'll, I'll let you have a link for that. But I thought also, given the timing, I'd give a quick heads up, um, I suppose primarily for any academics who are here on um, the talk today, but also perhaps it'd be really interesting in due course um, to connect with uh, others um, in the room as well. Um, we have um, at SAGSA just been um, awarded a set of funding uh, from British Council Scotland to bring some PhD and uh, early career researchers from outside of Scotland um, here uh, next year, particularly thinking around areas of environmental arts and humanities. And the very first step that we're making in that is to uh, start to form some clusters led by ac academics, but intersecting with external organizations, very much of the types that are in the room today. Um, so I've got a link for that as well. And if any of you, I imagine most of you will be in, obviously interested in this area, but if you're interested in being involved with that, it's very much a scoping exercise at the moment. So please 
fill that in and it would be great to 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 work with you on that as that scheme unfolds but that's it from me so Kirsten thanks very much I'll hand back to you and have a great morning brilliant thank you for that Claire um so I think Rachel is going to introduce our first speaker yes thank you so I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Andrew Patrizio, who's going to speak to us first. So Andrew uh, holds the Chair of Scottish Visual Culture at the University of Edinburgh. He teaches and writes in, in two main areas, Scottish post-1945 art and also on ecological artists, themes and methods. Um, represented most fully in his book, The Ecological Eye, Assembling an Eco-Critical Art History, which came out in 2019. Other books include Contemporary Scottish Sculpture, Stefan Geck, uh, apologies if I've pronounced that incorrectly, Anatomy Acts and Ilana Halperin. Um, so e exhibitions that he's worked on include the Scottish Endarkament and he has recently published book chapters on Scottish artist Christine Borland, Ilana Halperin and Eco Apocalypse in visual arts since the 1960s. Um, interestingly, he also led the Scottish Green Party's development of a new arts, culture and heritage policy which was adopted in 2017. He's also had full-time curatorial posts at the Hayward Gallery, London and Glasgow Museums, and he's currently on the Little Sparta Trust um, and the Editorial Board of Interdisciplinary Science Reviews and is a founding member of the European Forum for Advanced Practices. So Andrew's going to talk to us about degrowing museums give us and give us some notes and reflections on that topic. Over to you, Andrew. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, morning, everyone. Um, I'm wondering, I think Natasha is going to kindly help sharing the screen. Brilliant. Yeah, that's worked well. Um, I'm going to uh, be fairly brief, fly through some quick ideas. Um, I'm also going to say that due to various issues I won't go into, I'm still away from my office, away from um, Scotland, in fact. So I might be having to move around uh, the hotel I'm currently in. Um, because my wife is also giving a talk in about ten, about 15 minutes as well and needs the broadband. Anyway, so I will be in and out, I'll drop around and I'll, 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 I'll hopefully uh, be able to say something uh, useful. But obviously thank you to Kirsten, thank you to Rachel, Alex, uh, the, the Graduate School generally and Natasha uh, for, for um, set, doing so much of the, the setup and the, and the, the help. Um, I've only got uh, two or three slides, so very little to worry about. I just want to offer some quick provocations that are relevant to, I think, to museums, uh, inflected with today's theme around resource, energy, climate ethics, sustainability, scale. Um, what I want to say is very notational, and there's obviously more work and thinking for me to do, but hopefully it's, it's useful and it sets some kind of ideas going for you. Um, I'm not a museum professional. Um, uh, as Rachel said, I was in the 1990s. Uh, but I realise and I recognise I'm not burdened by running and keeping open a cultural space. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to later speakers uh, who are working either within um, museum spaces or working across Scottish institutions. So the main idea I want to throw out there is this counterintuitive word of degrowth. Um, and put that into the equation. And there are ways to think about this. So one way is very simply modernity particularly a kind of capitalist version of modernity, certainly an extractivist notion of modernity, but not only, um, it has been and is still obsessed by growth. And this is a violent obsession. And it represents, I think, an assault on peoples. It re represents assault on fellow animals. And it represents an assault on habitats. And capitalism and colonialism acts as if the world can be made infinitely, infinitely abundant. And that's false, and it's self-serving, of course, and it's unjust, and it's cruel. Um, it's a great positive start to get the morning off to, isn't it? Um, but it's unsustainable, of course, for nations to behave in this way. And of course, therefore, it means it's unsustainable for museums to behave in this way. Um, degrowth, as a term, pictures the Earth as a system of flows, of materials, of energies, and has a number of, um, that recognizes, if you like, a number of limits beyond which we can extract no more, okay? So it's a relatively new idea of de degrowth. It has some roots in the 19th century, but it offers, I think, some interesting alternatives for museums and for the way they picture creativity, for the way they think about their educational role, and obviously the way they think about their cultural role. So part one, which is represented by some of the images I've got on the, on the first 
um, slide here is this notion of growth and the mega museum. And somehow, it's fairly obvious, I think, that cultural, global cultural policy got hooked on the idea of the mega museum, parallel in a way to the mega global sporting event that is very dominant now, and with roots in, for example, the 1851 Great Exhibition, but also, I think, closely connected to global tourism industries and to notions of regeneration. And the resources, of course, that a mega museum requires does inevitably do damage to local economies, even if it looks like growth and regeneration. And it makes them pretty environmentally unfriendly. Um, despite, and I think this is important, the, the brilliance very often of their individual collections in an atomized way, and the cultural work that they do and the experiences that they offer. So we've got to think about that little section, of obviously, too, as part of the equation. Um, early examples, and I've got some images here of, say, the Guggenheim Museum, which would be an early um, uh, example of regeneration and product placement, almost, in a way, of, of, for Guggenheim, and Frank Gehry's building in Bilbao. Um, more modestly, you've got uh, the, the reconverted Baltic uh, flour mill in uh, Gateshead, um, and that operate for me vulnerable gentrification models that they use and they move into depressed port areas invariably that have become deindustrialized and they can easily evaporate if local councils or big donors fail to continue to subsidize so they feel in a way less sustainable because the contextual conditions seem so fragile i'll come on to some complexities within with that in a way already <clears throat> so, the mega museum's model has definitely gone east, and um, maybe following the, the turbine hall Tate Modern uh, 2000, in, in, that opened in 2000. I'm thinking here of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, the architect was Jean Nouvel, um, which was a collaboration, of course, between Western colonial powers and oil rich countries investing in an ocean of greenwashing um, around cultural projects. Another one illustrated here would be Hong Kong's very new M Plus Museum, built by Herzog and de Meuron, of course the architects of Tate Modern. Over 18 floors, you've got the SIG collection, which is the best modern contemporary collection of Chinese art on display, amongst many, many other activities. So both projects in the Emirates and in China are sustainable, as long as rich government and inward investment uh, support continues. And the M Plus also, interestingly enough, on their website, shares its own sustainability policy online. And I've got a link to that in my last slide. If you want to have a, uh, a, another person discussing that in a bit more detail, the art historian J, uh, David Joselit um, did a talk for the Harvard Graduate School of Design a couple of years ago called Heritage and Debt, Art in Globalization. And again, I've got a link to that talk in, at the end. A couple of general reflections here would be, we all realize that the term sustainable depends on a whole set of contexts and support structures before we can really get a good sense of the term sustainable. In a sense, with, I say, Middle Eastern oil and the Chinese government and the finance behind them, both the Louvre, Abu Dhabi and M Plus seem very sustainable. But is this what we mean by sustainability? In other words, deep pockets. Neither buildings would look that sustainable if the economic basis for oil production and the countries that benefit from that, if that collapsed with a move towards renewables elsewhere, or if the sea level rises between four and five meters in Hong Kong Harbor. So deep sustainability and very fragile sustainability is one of the complexities I want to throw out there. Another thing I think, when I obviously struggle with this notion as well, which is, um, museums are about growth, not degrowth, but growth. But it's a kind of immaterial growth, an intimate growth. The things that aren't captured through scale and extraction. Degrowth is about challenging economic unfairness, but that can be a basis for regrowth in this immaterial sense, which I think museums come into play. Natasha, could I have the, the, the next slide, please? Great, and that's my final slide, pretty much. Um, so, some alternatives. Let's think of some alternatives here. So, um, one I think is interesting is the Stedelijk in Netherlands, uh, which internally, in terms of an infrastructure, has been focusing on internal leadership and ideas of degrowth very explicitly. And, it and in the context of this mega museum push, it believes that museum logics are illogical and they're unsustainable. 
Beatrix Ruff, who's the director of the Stadelic, hosted um, what was called the Verbier Arts Summit um, five years ago, now 2017, and produced this book, Size Matters, Degrowth of the 21st Century Art Museum. And it might be, those of you, if you don't know it, it might be an interesting place to, to pursue some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, then I want to register the fact that there's academic scholarship, and again, I've got links in the next slide. Um, Jenny Morgan and Sharon MacDonald, um, key uh, r academics writing on cultural policy and museums, 2020, produced a paper called Degrowing Museum Collections for New Heritage Futures. Uh, that was in the International Journal of Heritage Studies. And what they were trying to do is produce a model of resistance to what they call the profusion struggle and the insatiable appetites of museums to accumulate and aspire to unhelpful growth. And therefore, I think one of the things I think that's most interesting is to be thinking much more actively as museums and uh, associated institutions as ecological systems. And that means realizing that they're ecologically bound, they are porous with their environment, they're organic, they're material, and they're locally embedded. They live, they exist in habitats. So small museums, small libraries, galleries, institutions work best, I think, when they're sympathetically networked with like-minded institutions. They give individual visitors enough space for individual revelation, inspiration, new knowledge, surprise, the kinds of things we always look for when we, uh, when we visit such um, places. There's no need for 18 floors of art. <coughs> um, that it might, may or may not be a short or a long haul flight away. So the theory behind this push against overexpansion um, comes from, I think, degrowth cultural ecology literature, which I think is very, very active at the moment. And it also comes from a slightly longer history of what we would call new materialist thinking. And I've just put up here, uh, you know, covers and references to two books representing those two um, orientations. One would be Jane Bennett's very well-known Vibrant Matter, um, A Political Ecology of Things, which is now 12 years old. Um, she doesn't speak about museums, Bennett doesn't speak about museums explicitly, but using her way of thinking, we can think of museums not as symbolic, essentialist spaces, but how they operate as a network of materials, of transfer of energies, of investment, of interrelations that perform an ecosystem. And if they do this well, I think in a sense they can be called sustainable. And then more recent work is by Fernando Dominguez Rubio, um, 2020, who spoke at one of the graduates, uh, the research seminars that Edinburgh History of Art um, subject area uh, hosted very recently. And his new book, Still Life, Ecologies of the Modern Imagination at the uh, Art Museum from Chicago, is a fascinating, fascinating um, book about thinking about, say, for example, the air conditioning, the breathability of a mu museum building, and to recognize its relationship to the temporary holding space for objects of value and how this is an assemblage of materials and flows that also links in the travel demands and patterns of the exhibition format or the actual visitors themselves and really considers the museum as this local habitat. So what kind of demand then to degrow might the museum respond to? So museums, I think this is really cru crucial, museums didn't invent the necessity of sustainability. They are not the root of the problem, right? Extraction industries, speculative capitalism, they are the root of the problem. So museums, including you know, representatives and colleagues speaking today, um, are also thinking about things like energy, technology, traditional ways of life and work. And that tells us a story about modernity and the assumptions of modernity. And they can be transformative and reflective spaces. And I was thinking about some of the museums that we have in, and institutions we have in Scotland can do a lot for environmental critical thinking that might parallel in a very different context what the DDR Museum in Berlin did, did does today and the War Remnants Museum in Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon in Vietnam, does for remembering difficult and violent pasts. So our industrial and transport museums, for example, might be a place to turn around some of this, these complex problems.
So museums, in my view, need to, or they will be forced to, through environmental conditions, to consider themselves as locally based but functioning through distributed networks. They're able to operate on relatively modest budgets, certainly modest budgets to some of the large governmental budgets being mobilized around the world, and they can use emergent bottom-up structures like we're seeing at the, um, uh, the, the Stedelijk in, in uh, the Netherlands. They can build audiences through shared recommendations and community connections, and they can be intimate spaces. I think intimate spaces is important. Um, supported by careful, knowledgeable interpretation and connection with the visiting communities. I mean, none of this, I think, costs much, but can be transformative. Andrew, so, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but um, would you be able to round up? Do you that's think? My, my last sentence. Oh, lovely, lovely. My last sentence. <laughs> oh, we'll so, give it again. <laughs> no, no, that was just to say, I, mean, I think we need to be realistic about the prospects of the global level for any of this. It's not great. But the local directions and specific locations, I think there's a lot of amazing work going on. Full stop. Thank Finish. you. So Lewis is our next speaker, um, and he is the culture shift producer at Creative Carbon Scotland, a charity working on the roles of arts and culture in addressing climate change. His role includes um, managing the public engagement project Climate Beacons, uh, which we're going to hear about a wee bit uh, later in more detail as well, I think, and uh, running the Green Teas event series that brings together people from cultural and climate backgrounds and researching and writing articles for the online library of creative sustainability, which sounds very interesting. His background prior to working at Creative Carbon Scotland is in classical music, having worked as a composer and on the teaching staff at Glasgow University in the music department there. So I'm um, very pleased to welcome you, Lewis. Um, we're going to speak about why the climate crisis is a crisis of culture and what culture can do to address it. Over to you. Uh, yes, thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. So uh, hopefully you can see my screen there. Let me know if you can't. So yes, I work at Creative Carbon Scotland. We are a charity working on the roles of arts and culture in addressing climate change in the arts and cultural sector across Scotland. So not just museums and galleries, but also theatres, voluntary arts, art centres and so on. Um, there are three main areas to our work, which I'm just showing on the screen, but I'm going to focus on one called Culture Shift, which is the area that I work on and is focused on developing collaboration between culture and climate fields to help culture influence broader changes to a more sustainable Scotland, which we need to see. Um, a big part of our work is this stuff about carbon management and trying to make the sector more sustainable in and of itself. But I think other speakers are covering that area quite well, so I'm going to focus on this culture shift area. Um, I think we all sort of know <laughs> why we're here, but I think it's important just to remind ourselves, I'm just going to give a few key insights from the recent um, IPCC sixth assessment report on climate change. Um, climate change is happening now. We often talk about it as though it's happening in the future, but we know that impacts are occurring right at this moment, as pointed out by uh, Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General. We know that its effects are unequal. This has now been quite explicitly recognised by the IPCC, which uh, stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I should say. Uh, always <laughs> spell out my acronyms. Um, it's quite interesting that they mention inequity, marginalisation, historical and ongoing patterns of inequity, such as colonialism and governance, as key factors in uh, the climate crisis going on right now. And we know that these reports are very difficult to agree wording on, they're very contested. So I think the fact that they managed to get that word colonialism in there, I think is, is very telling and shows the, um, the importance of considering these factors very strongly when we work on climate change here in Scotland. We know that greater action is required. Uh, any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. So we know that what's being done so far is not enough. Even the, the pledges that have been made by the parties of the UN would only limit warming to 1.8 degrees. We're meant to be aiming for 1.5 degrees. Um, that image I've just put to accompany this is an installation at Thai Kiss of a, a museum and art centre on an isle of North Uist. They uh, put this installation of lines showing predicted sea level rise by uh, 2100 uh, on North US, which would basically 
annihilate their art center. And in fact, they're currently not able to get planning permission to expand or make any changes to their buildings because of predicted flooding. Uh, also worth noting that opposition to work on climate change is powerful. I think we don't recognize this enough in the sector because we're surrounded by other people who are also trying to fix climate change, but opposition is there. Again, this has now been explicitly recognized by the IPCC, and given how difficult it is to get this wording in, um, it's worth really listening to. So um, including, I think, particularly this point about how accurate transference of the climate science has been undermined significantly by climate change counter movements. Um, again, this is recognized by the UN. So <laughs> bearing all this slightly terrifying stuff in mind, uh, what role can arts and culture have <laughs> in all this? Um, and I think in many ways it points to the strong roles that arts and culture can have in trying to bring about broader change, but I think sometimes there are a few steps we need to go through that are sometimes quite uh, cosy and insular world of arts and culture can feel disconnected from these issues, but I think in fact it's very intimately connected and there are some really important roles that we can take. Um, Firstly, that climate change is about more than facts. So often we think about climate change as a matter of science and technology, which it very much is, but it's also about how we bring about broader social change. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I do read a lot um, of literature on framing and communication of climate change. And something that comes up uh, over and over again is this issue about <laughs> human irrationality, or perhaps to put it more charitably, charitably beyond rationality that we don't uh, make our decisions consciously, uh, we don't re rely purely on logic, things like emotion, metaphors, narratives really matter. And I think we have to bear this in mind when trying to build climate change movements. Of course, this is an area where in theory, arts and culture ought to excel the world of metaphors and narratives and so on. Um, an example I think about quite a lot is this one on the right, that when uh, in American, the American Congress, they were trying to get Yellowstone made the first national park. These paintings by Thomas Moran were hung around Congress as part of their efforts to get that, uh, that motion passed. And I think it's just worth noting that the people who put up those paintings didn't think someone would look at it and immediately be like, oh, we should make this into a national park. But it did create the necessary, uh, the necessary uh, psychological frame or uh, ideological backing that made it possible for people to support that motion. And I think that's quite an important part of the how we frame the role of arts and culture, that if we think that someone has to see a painting and immediately decide that they're going to do more about climate change, um, we're always going to <laughs> fail, I think. But uh, if we think that uh, arts and culture can provide this sort of unconscious, emotive, uh, uh, framing that is needed to, to provoke action, I think we can have a very successful role. Um, again, the fact that climate change is a cultural issue is recognised across different sectors. So the organisation Climate Outreach, not a cultural body, but a body that works on communicating climate change, recognised that simply pointing to the science wasn't enough, something was missing. And they go on to talk about the importance of things like visuals and storytelling to communicate the message better. And the author, Amitav Ghosh, talks about the climate crisis as a crisis of culture. Uh, and he asks the question, why, where are all the climate change novels? Um, because we really need to be able to imagine in new ways to be able to think our way out of this. And arts and culture can influence change. So we know that in Scotland, 86% of adults were culturally engaged in 2020. That's COVID era figures, so they're actually lower than normal. Um, and 83% of adults participated in some form of cultural activity in 2020. So we know that the arts and culture reach a really important large amount of the population. And we know that as a result, arts and culture do have this power to reinforce negative uh, social tropes or to promote positive alternative ones. This graphic on the right is one that quite interests me. It was created by Van Jones, who is a, a political campaign and worked on lots of electoral campaigns, including for Barack Obama. And he wrote this book called Rebuild the Dream, where he argued that to bring about political or social change, you need to have work in these four areas. And I think three of them are ones that we tend to think about a lot in terms of climate change. So um, the governments and lobbyists, 
uh, campaigners, uh, researchers and scientists, but he also includes this art artists and cultural producers area as one of the key ones. And again, this is coming from someone who is not an artist or a cultural professional himself. I think it's uh, always encouraging when these people from other fields recognize that this is an important area of work. And this recognition is coming from a number of different quarters now. So the Scottish government's net zero nation public engagement strategy talks about the role of uh, culture and heritage to help deliver the culture and societal change that will be required to support our transition to net zero. Um, there's also a growing literature um, from various research angles that has um, interrogated whether artistic work actually um, brings about changes in attitudes and a lot of it is broadly supportive. So there was this article from 2019 that suggested that exposure to immersive activism art, this was a particular installation called Pollution Pods by Michael Pinsky, um, which uh, allowed people to walk through pods that would allow them to experience different levels of air pollution in different world cities. And so it was uh, a work of art which was particularly immersive in character. And it did increase intentions to engage in actions to address pollution and climate change. Again, people didn't go there and then immediately uh, march to the Houses of Parliament and start protesting, but it did lay the groundwork that was required to bring about those changes. And I think it's really important to frame ourselves in this way that um, we're laying that psychological groundwork a lot of the time um, and working alongside the kind of more active forms of work on climate change. Um, and just to kind of give my suggestions of things that I think arts and culture can do, this is very much a non-exhaustive list, um, but some of the, the roles which I think I've experienced. So making issues visible, comprehensible and relevant. Climate change is uh, a global uh, issue, which is very hard to conceptualize. The philosopher Timothy Morton described it as a hyper object of this thing, which is so multifaceted and, and complex that it, it is very difficult for us to hold in our heads. So the arts can play this role in simply making climate change something that is comprehensible and works in terms of our human psychology. I think that's a very important role. Reaching new people in new ways. We know that to address climate change in an effective and equitable way, we all need to be involved in the process and too often uh, lots of demographics here in Scotland and worldwide are left out of the process of consulting and making decisions on climate policy. Um, cultural institutions with their very developed work on outreach, for example, can play a really key role in just reaching people and finding ways for people to participate in discussion and decision making about climate change. That's very vital. Framing and imagination I've touched on quite a lot already. I think that is um, a really key role for artists and creative practitioners. Simply creating spaces for discussion, consultation and empowerment. Uh, our cu cultural venues are really vital public spaces in that they're places where anyone can go, that you can, in a lot of cases, get in for free uh, and simply be there. These are increasingly uh, vital spaces, I think, in our public life, somewhere that people can gather either for formal events about climate change or simply providing space for people to, to get together and discuss and build movements. Um, this process of building consensus and communities, I think, is really vital. We know that individual actions on climate change, such as working on your own uh, carbon footprint, are important, but it's not enough in itself. Climate change is something that uh, has to be solved on, a, on the level above the individual, and we can't do that without finding ways of working together. So it's really important for us as arts and cultural organizations, not just to look at ourselves, but also to think about other organizations we can work with, such as environmental bodies, research bodies, community groups, and so on. Uh, care and well-being, I think, is very important. Um, climate change is increasingly a, a threat to mental health and well-being, um, especially for people who work on it actively all the time. So I think arts and culture can provide that space for sort of healing and care, which I think is increasingly important. And then I just put the unexpected, which I think is something that, uh, again, arts and culture ought to excel at, this kind of serendipity, 
um, the things that you don't expect that come up along the way, which um, often is something that there's not so much space for within different fields such as government policy on climate change, which is very target based, which is important, but I think it's also important to provide space for things which you don't necessarily predict in advance. And I think that's something that we in arts and culture can succeed at pretty well. So I'm going to leave it off there. Hopefully that gives a good introduction to why I think arts and culture do matter in this context. And yes, very happy to uh, answer questions about this framing or how it applies to our work as an organisation. Uh, so Kirsten and I were, were sort of planning for me to give a little bit of an introduction to the climate crisis and uh, a little bit about uh, sort of environmental humanities and an arts approach. Um, and originally it was going to sit earlier in the session and now it's sitting here now. And I'm realizing that um, Andrew and Lewis have done such a good job that they're, they've um, they've covered a, a bit of what I was going to say, but I, I, am, I am going to talk a little bit about them. I realize I'm uh, preaching to the choir to a certain extent, um, I imagine with this audience, but um, I guess there, the opportunity is to really um, to to raise some questions that we might want to to bring up in in the later discussion uh, points or the times for discussion later. So I wanted to speak first of all briefly about how we are living in anthropocenic times. Um, I don't have any slides, so I hope it's okay just to <laughs> to follow my voice. Um, we're living in Anthropocenic times. Uh, this is this means that there's overwhelming evidence that atmospheric, geologic, hydrologic, biospheric, and other Earth system processes are now altered by humans. Um, the Anthropocene defines Earth's most recent geological time period as human influenced or anthropogenic. Um, and I think the justification for this this script and and it's become quite a dominant one. Um, is indeed persuasive. As the environmental historian Robert Nixon writes, the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle and rate of extinct extinction are radically altered. Unprecedented numbers of radionuclides and fossilised plastics have been created. Mega cities have been erected that will leave impact long after they function as cities. The pH of the ocean is changed. Life forms have been moved around the world intentionally and inadvertently creating novel ecosystems everywhere. Of vertebrate terrestrial life, humans and our domesticated animals now constitute over 90% by weight, with less than 10% comprised by wild creatures, which is a funny way of measuring it by weight, but is also quite mind-boggling, 90% and 10% domesticated to wild. And in the last century, the average temperature has risen 10 times faster than it did when the world was recovering from the ice age and warming up after the last ice age. And in the next century, that rate is predicted to accelerate at 20 times the average. So these sorts of facts are, are very sobering and they're really important. And the Anthropocene script has sort of allowed us to, to communicate them and to communicate their severity. Um, and the, it's been very helpful in calling attention to this reshaping, but it's perhaps not nearly nuanced enough as a concept, and I'm not the only one to say this, many, many before me have said it. It's a grand narrative, it's a hegemonic and totalising concept, and it doesn't acknowledge the ways in which human societies and groups have been disproportionately responsible for, as well as impacted by climate change and biodiversity loss as well. And actually, Lewis... I pointed very, very um, clearly to this, um, the sort of inequity of, of the situation we find ourselves in. Um, and uh, the reason I bring this up is that um, Jason Moore is one particular critic of the concept of the Anthropocene. He, he is a key proponent instead of the use of the term capitalocene so that we can clearly define this as the age of capital. And I think, I think this is a, an interesting and useful approach 
So that is, it's not humankind who have created the Anthropocene, argue Moore and others, but rather it is those amongst us who have driven and benefited from, benefited from the extraction and accumulation so damaging to our natural world. As Moore puts it, not all humans are geological actors. But we are experiencing, we are all experiencing a defuturing, as design theorist Tony Fry puts it. He describes this as a paradoxical condition that results um, when a form of life premised on carboniferous capitalism as the engine of limitless growth and endless mass consumption that um, Andrew was referring to earlier, um, this growth, limitless growth, actively negates the future and the critical faculties for engaging with this negation. And that's something that I'll, uh, I want to come back to in a, a little bit, this, um, the critical factors, faculties for engaging with this negation. So trying to address these issues and more, there have been numerous meetings of the nations of the world, as you'll all know, perhaps most notably under the banner of the COP meetings, the United Nations Climate Change Conferences, or Conference of Parties for short, uh, COP number 26 was in Glasgow in November 21 um, and you know it seemed a point in time when the critical nature of our ecological and social political moment was really hard to avoid even mainstream media um, was talking about um, there being a real pressure to reach agreements globally that would keep the world at less than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures that's the 1.5 everyone's talking about um, and COP26 was dubbed as the last best hope in the popular press. But it, it I think most commentators have agreed, certainly. Um, well, maybe not the, <laughs> the government, Westminster government, but I think most agreed that it ended disappointingly. Um, it was a fortnight after which, as the politicians and officials themselves admitted, the goal of limiting temperature rises to that 1.5 degrees was left on life support. However, it arguably did bring a much heightened awareness within Scotland to the issues. You know, it was one of the wonderful things was that the um, with it being um, cited here and, and located here, you know, it really it b became part of the public consciousness um, and the issues that it was trying to address. And the fringe and cultural events that uh, amassed in the city of Glasgow during November were amazing. They were fiercely critical. They were fiercely hopeful. They were wonderfully creative. Um, so I, you know, I didn't want to say that it was <laughs> a complete waste of time because there was wonderful, um, there was wonderful work done there and lots of great comings together of people from all over the world and many people who are, were, you know, as I was mentioning, are some of the worst affected, most affected by climate change and biodiversity loss, um, were able to, to send people in person to be there and to to connect with, with others and activists and, and uh, workers in the city. Since COP, uh, so since November, we've had numerous reports from the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, um, the United Na Nations Body for Assessing the Science Related to Climate Change. Uh, they provide providing regular assessments of the scientific basis of climate change, its impacts and future risks and options for adap adaptation and mitigation. The, the working groups of the IPCC have been completing their sixth assessment of late, you know, so again, this has been going on for a long time. We've known this was happening for a long time um, and it, uh, you know, we're, we're waking up slowly, <laughs> too slowly. Um, but anyway, most recent have been the reports on impacts and future risks, as well as work on what mitigation is essential and what's still possible. They're really sobering reads. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the Impacts and Future Risks report, for instance, an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. It showed that climate impacts are already more widespread and severe than expected, even with just 1.1 degrees of warming. That's where we're kind of sitting. Uh, and I think we can all think of examples of um, the drought, extreme heat, the floods, the fires, the drops in crop productivity that, that we know are, are happening all over the world. And just on that last one, I was reading that in Africa, crop productivity shrunk by a third um, due to climate change since the 60s, or has 
shrunk by a third since the 60s. So, you know, huge, huge changes happening and being increasingly acknowledged. Um, even if we rapidly decarbonize, the reports were saying we're locked into even worse impacts in the near future. So the near future is a, a time of, of real crisis. And this is likely to throw millions of people into extreme poverty. Risks will escalate quickly with higher temperatures, often causing irreversible changes. And inequity, conflict and development challenges will heighten vulnerability to climate risks. So there's a lot of doom. But there are also hopeful weeds, in particular the most recent report on mitigation. And um, I'll speed up a little bit here, but it furthers the argument that adaptation is critical and that we already have feasible ways of, of doing this. You know, the, the ways and means exist. It's maybe the, the will that is missing, the political will and the economic. We need to help vulnerable communities more also, and we need, according to the report, to challenge some of the biggest cultural, social and political norms that exist, and primarily, perhaps, the pursuit of limitless economic growth. So linking back, back to what Andrew was saying. And in chapter five of the report, it's interesting that the authors begin their argument along these lines, noting that um, uh, people demand services and not primary energy and physical resources per se, and focusing on demand for services and the different social and political roles people play broadens the climate solution space. And one of the authors of the report has put in uh, that this in itself is a really big result for this report because it basically says that all we need is services. We don't need the energy use itself so that we can then think about how we deliver those services in a more efficient way, she says, and then we can demonstrate that what you need to uh, need to do that exists already and then you get to these results that are really quite staggering she says that you can really do things very very differently my point here is you know to pick out a specific example she's talking about energy use but but really this report is shifting things and saying um you know we we demand the services we demand the sort of the ways uh, of um or what what things will provide we don't demand the way to get there and there's space then for thinking very differently about how we do that so that hope gap maybe you know it's but very different ways are possible for filling that and then um, i maybe won't say so much about the environmental humanities and arts here because i realize i'm also talking over my 10 minutes but just that um you know parts of the part of the reason we wanted to talk a little bit about the environmental humanities and arts is that um, for more than a decade now, there's been this movement within the environment, within the humanities and the arts to sort of group together and provide a strong humanities and arts response to the climate crisis, to, to pull across many disciplines and think about how together we can um, provide ways to cope with um, the loss, the grief, the the challenges uh, and difficulties but also how of, of the moment but how we can also communicate uh, beautifully strongly effectively and and um, as one of the environmental humanities um, kind of scholars that I, I read Anna Singh has put it how we can craft arts of living on a, dim a damaged planet together and I think this is you know I think most of the people involved in the environmental humanities and arts are you know that very aware of our entanglements in these complex industrial ecologies that we've created and that are threatening the livability of our shared world but we're also keen to show that um you know those that that we shouldn't just be relying on sort of techno fixes and the physical sciences to come up with solutions that actually we need to bring in all sorts of disciplines and approaches in order to be able to imagine things differently. So without further ado, we're, we're asking with this next section of, um, of the event, uh, what does a climate conscious cultural sector look like and how do we get there? That's one of the main questions of the whole event. And we asked in our, ad, uh, in our advert, uh, is this by declarations of climate emergency or by reduction of institutions' carbon emissions? Is it by rethinking what is programmed and how we understand our remits going forward? Is it by integrating sustainability throughout our places and practices rather than seeing it as a separate thing, perhaps? Or by looking critically at who funds us? 
or how we disentangle ourselves from the normalisation of global travel, perhaps, and the pursuit of economic growth. And I would say it's perhaps all of these things and it's more. If we think about the environmental futures that all the reports and data and lived experience are telling, uh, are telling us are coming, then how can we not reimagine the purpose and practices of our institutions and programmes to be fit for them? Surely we need to be thinking about the essential mitigation we must do and surely our adaptation and transition is crucial. So in the next section of the event, three speakers from the museum sector will share their valuable perspectives. They'll stop me speaking. They will speak of their transformative ambitions for our cultural organisations and their values and practices and tell us uh, about some of the measures already being taken to reduce the environmental impact of the sector whilst raising its eco-consciousness. I think for those of us in other areas, um, perhaps not particularly in museums, say in working in universities, we can we can use this as an opportunity to sort of compare and contrast a little and think about our areas of focus and action. But the emphasis here is on turning conscience into action. Um, and I would say that's very much at the heart of this event as we focus on what we can do as part of this wider sector to become what the scholar David Orr calls ecologically literate or climate conscious and importantly to transform holistically and in such a way that our greening is to the core. So I will now stop talking <laughs> and hand over to Thank Chris. you. Thank you for that, Rachel. I'm just going to introduce Alex again. So Alex, as we know, is the Climate Officer for Museum Gallery, Museums Gallery Scotland, MGS, and his role is to work with the museum and wider cultural sector in progressing the sector to become more sustainable itself and to use its platform to engage with communities on the issue. And this has covered a range of areas, including training, carbon management, grants and funding, policy work, and also data collection. And his background before this role was a mixture of science and policy with previous climate work in local authorities and international development. So I'm going to hand over to Alex now, who's going to talk about the role of museums in climate change and sustainability. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Kirsten. Hi, everyone. Um, so bear with me and I'll just bring my slides up. Um, da, da, da. There we go. Is that all working for everyone? Perfect. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm delighted to be joining you today, as, as, as Kirsten said, um, to talk about the, the role of, of museums in climate change and sustainability. Um, so I've been in my role as, as climate officer for about uh, eight, nine months now. So, so it's, it's a fairly new role. Um, and I'm... There's no presentation, Alex. It's not on the screen. Oh, oh it worked so well before. Sorry about this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alexander. Hang on. That works, thank you. There we go. Of course, as soon as it's the live production, something goes wrong. Um, so as I say, yeah, I've only been in this role about eight, eight nine months or so, um, and we're, it's, it's a relatively new area for MGS and a really exciting one. Um, so I'd just like to talk to you about kind of what we're doing and the role of museums in climate change and sustainability. Um, so I'm starting with this being really broad and asking you to think about what this, what the, about this in a kind of wider cultural context to start with. And I hope the GIF isn't too distracting, but I just, I love it. So I, I always try and include it. Um, given the, the wonderful speeches that have been going on before, I won't dwell too much on the role of culture, um, but I'd like to, to touch on it just at the start as it's relevant to the part that museums can play. Um, so as has been said, kind of climate and culture are, are fated to be inextricably linked with, with each other, with both influencing the other. You know, the climate that we live in is often dictated by our culture, and our culture ends up dictating how we treat the climate. There's that um, old untrue joke um, that Inuits have hundreds of words for snow, Saudis have hundreds of words, words for sand, and British people have thousands for rain. Um, so looking at the impact that culture can actively have on climate change, obviously, I think one of the most obvious things, practically speaking, is that we all know that cultural sites can act as main sources of tourism for places, and including museums. Um, and with this brings operational emissions um, through travel and, and consumerism and, and all that wonderful stuff. Um, so if we're looking at culture being a sustainable sector, we need to look at kind of how that looks in a post COVID net zero world and what museums roles are within that. Um, it's estimated that, oops, bear with me, there we go. 
<laughs> um, it's estimated that tourism is responsible for, for roughly 8% of the world's carbon emissions. And obviously that can change kind of depending on what you include. Um, but if you look at things like uh, plane flights, um, boat rides to, to souvenirs and lodgings, um, various activities contribute to tourism's carbons, carbons, tourism's carbon footprint. Um, so there's a practical and technical way of looking at the sector and museums for their contribution to climate change, which, as I say, isn't significant when you look at the numbers. But the cultural sector isn't just an emitter. It's not just that those facts and figures and, and the carbon that's, that's put into the atmosphere. It can be an absolutely incredible tool in the battle against climate change, um, as the other speakers have, have brilliantly talked about. And for me, one of the big differences that culture has compared to, to other disciplines like science or economics is that you know, we, we have enough data and evidence to prove that climate change is caused by burning of fossil fuels and by certain actions. You know, that, that's not an uncontroversial statement. And uh, it's not a controversial statement, sorry. Um, and we also know what we need to do to be able to stop it. But I think all of the graphs and all of the charts in the world aren't motivating, aren't motivating people to act to the degree that we need to. Um, now, you can make arguments for a range of reasons as to why that is. But as I say, one of them, for me, it's that graphs and charts don't resonate with people. They don't bring it home. Um, and I think that's what culture, uh, the cultural sector and, and museums can do, I think. Um, and you'll, you'll see from my next slide that great minds obviously think alike, because this is the same one that, that Lewis included um, in his slide. So I won't go on talking about it too much, because um, as, as I say, it was explained what it was before. Um, but I just wanted to include it, because for me, when I first came across this, as much as I am a science geek and, and graphs and charts do it for me, um, this struck me far more, I think. It's a very stark visualization of what this can actually mean. Um, and this is a, a prime example, I think, of, of where the potential for culture and, and arts and heritage as well in climate change can come in for me. Um, they can take what can be quite a, a distant global polar bears on ice in a faraway lands problem um, into a, a local present problem, which is impacting their area, their beaches, their flooded river. You know, Scotland is going to feel um, less of the impacts of climate change, but it's going to be far from immune from it. So I think we need to find a way, particularly in Scotland, of, of engaging with people in that. So now looking, as I say, moving on to looking at more of the role of museums in climate change. Um, as I say, what, what I've promised to talk about. <laughs> um, so museums do many, many things. Um, and in, including that is, is they provide a, a safe space for people to learn. You know, people come to a museum with the intention of learning, of, of finding something out and with an open mind. And, and that gives the ability to engage with people that a lot of other organizations don't have. Um, a lot of the museums we work with are based around something local, something that is based um, or, or that has happened locally. And, and that's one of the strengths that museums have in this approach is that when it comes to climate change, it brings it to that local area, to their environment, their community, and ties into their history um, and can really help to, to bridge that gap between data and action and the distance issue that I talked about before and, and making it real for people, I think. So building on from that, then what, what I've just talked about is, is I'd like you to think about the kind of the action and the role that museums can can take and play in in two different ways um so as, as was talked about you know the, the theme of this discussion is kind of what will the cultural sector look like and what can we do so for me it broadly boils down into these two different ways they can take this this direct action the practical stuff that i talked about for their emissions um and through our work at mgs we found the kind of overall broad categories for this um, or obviously the first one is through making is through efforts of making um, buildings and offices greener, looking at how they manage their collections, um, the staff and volunteer travel, waste management, visitor travel, and cafe or retail operations. Um, or they can do this um, this kind of indirect action where this is more about utilizing that unique position of engagement and education that museums hold, of being a space of, of open education and engagement with the public um, to talk about climate change and more importantly, to get people to act as well. What this might look like on both sides is something that is unique to each museum and each organization. Um, 
you know, using the, the strengths and specifics of, of their own assets. You know, when, when talking to museums, the first question, if they want to get involved with, with climate change, one of the first things we talk about is kind of, well, what do you already have that you can use? You know, what is your unique selling point? Um, and one of the things with, with my role is what I'd love to be able to do with, with every museum is, is to get them to think about carbon costs automatically in the same way that they think of financial costs for any work undertaken. You know, it, it's whenever a new project or piece of work is undertaken, it's almost subconsciously that economic costs are factored in. And I'd love to be able to get to a point where the, the same is done for carbon, um, obviously quote unquote carbon, but all kind of, you know, greenhouse gases and, and pollutions. Um, as people think in, in pounds and pence, it would be fantastic for them to think about kilos or tons of carbon too. Um, but I think we're a little bit um, off there yet. So what I thought would be useful now um, is just to talk about a few case studies from, from Scottish museums, um, which some of you may have already come across before or, or have heard about, um, but it just gives an idea of, of what all that looks like and can look like in reality. Um, so the first one that I've included here is with Dumfries and Galloway Aviation Museum. And they applied for funding from our Resilience um, and Recovery Fund, which was set up in response to COVID. Um, and they use this to fund the installation of a solar panel system to make them a net zero consumer of electricity. Um, this was in response to the to tough financial situation that affected all museums during COVID, um, as electricity costs for this museum were previously 20% um, of their fixed costs. And this was be before the recent high recent uh, price hikes. Um, I'm sure as well, the, the message of, of this happening at an aviation museum with all the impact that aviation has on climate change won't be missed. Um, but it, it also demonstrates, I think, kind of how, how important the role of ambition is on the part of the museum um, to be able to, to take action. Um, you know, th this museum, it's, it's in an area which has suffered economically, but it, the museum itself is small and has less than 10 full-time staff members. But it was that ambition that led it to be able to to make these steps and the support that we were able to offer as well. Um, it's, it's an interesting point here, actually, when I was thinking about this, because we, we recently finished um, a couple of months ago, uh, a capital resilience grant um, that we ran, which focused on capital projects um, that museums could make with one of the, the focuses being on um, energy efficiency. Um, and over half of the applicants that we had applied for energy efficiency or renewable energy projects that, that are, the primary reason being that they were citing was the, the recent um, price hikes for energy, but also there was that desire to, to become more green. So there really is that push from museums, especially in Scotland at least, um, to want to be able to act on this um, for, for a number of reasons. The, the second case study um, is of the, the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum, because frankly, I don't think you can, you can get a more Scottish museum. Um, and they've undertaken a redevelopment to become as, as wholly sustainable a museum as they can. And they did this by looking at balancing their the conservation needs alongside environmental ones. So for this, this was a process that was done um, over a period of, of years with um, a few different funding streams. And, and their new building included um, timber cladding from untreated Scottish Douglas, Douglas fir board. Um, a green roof sown with succulent called sedum, which, which cools in the summer and, and insulates in the winter. They had a, a ground source heat pump installed, um, an earth to air heat exchanger, um, a thermal mass wall. And then they also installed solar panels um, on the roof above their cafe to generate electricity. So that was like, it was a real kind of re a whole redevelopment of their building. The, the, the last case study that I've put in here, um, just touches on that more indirect stuff on that public engagement one. Um, and it was, it's the creation of an ocean-based exhibit called Dive In, which was being housed at Wardlaw Museum in St. Andrews. Um, but it is a collaboration between a, a range of partners in and around St. Andrews. And what they did was they set up a, an ocean-based exhibit um, to create an interactive look at the oceans and the issues they face, starting from the depths and kind of and looking at each issue as you rise up um, right up until the shore. So there was a focus here to look at the issues our oceans face, but then tie these to solutions and to asks and actions that each person that visited it could do. Um, but what they did that was quite unique was when somebody entered the museum, they were asked to identify with, with one of four levels. Um, 
that linked to their knowledge and their commitment um, on oceans and climate change. And then as they went around each section, the asks associated at each level were, were linked to the level that they committed to when they walked in. So if you came to the museum thinking you were starting fresh, there are suggestions of first steps you can take. Whereas if you came thinking, I already know some stuff and I want to work you know, on getting my family and friends to do more, then the asks got progressively more and more complex. Um, this was designed in, in collaboration with, with academics, behavioral analysts, museum staff, and, and climate people as well. Um, and they recently, I think it was last month or so, um, finished the, the follow-up with people after the visit to find how it impacted their behavior. And, and they did find it quite um, effective in, in making people change. Um, I don't think it was as much as they were hoping for, but it was still an, a very impressive outcome. So obviously um, that was some examples of what museums are doing, um, but one of the actions that, that we've taken at MGS um, over the last few months since I've been here was a, a sector-wide survey to really help to get an understanding of views and current activity within museums on climate change and sustainability um, across Scotland. So the survey went into more detail than the original, than the question you can see at the top here. Um, and it looked into stuff like reduction efforts, measurement activity challenges, areas of support, et cetera. And that's all going to be released um, next month as part of a, a wider climate strategy that MGS is putting out. But I wanted to share this, this overview data that we received back to this question, because it really shows strongly that 95% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that climate change was an important issue for their organization, um, which is obviously fantastic and it's a great headline. Um, but a lot of the other data that we received showed a disconnect between this belief and desire and the action that museums were taking. Um, now this was for a range of very valid reasons around time, staff, financial resources, or knowing where and how to start also. Um, you know, there, there is some incredible work going on across museums, which, you know, Victoria and Alexander are, are, are two prime examples. Um, but as with any kind of sector that spans over 400 organizations, you know, there is a range of knowledge and expertise within it. Some museum staff know more about climate change than I ever will. And some are just starting out on that journey themselves. So what this all means then for, for up from, from our point of view, um, is that it becomes our job at MGS and, and mine more specifically to come up with ways in which we can support the sector and support museums to turn that 95% agreement into action. Um, and given the way that, that MGS operates, as in we, we don't have any direct say over museum operations, you know, they're independent organizations with their own governing bodies and boards, but we identified um, areas that we could make progress. So the first is, is carbon management, so measuring and reducing carbon footprints. Um, this is something we're looking at both internally and to encourage museums to do. Um, you know, at, at MGS, we're just starting to report to Sustainable Scotland Network. Um, but we found with our survey that a relatively small number of museums were measuring um, their footprint. And although more said they were, they were taking steps to reduce it, which is great, but there's still quite a bit of work there to be done, I think. Um, another string in our bow is being able to offer training and advice to museums, um, and this can take, a, 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 we're looking at offering a range of different formats for this to be able to, to match the kind of the time and resources commitment that a museum might be able to make. Um, we're also building a bank of resources um, through things like our climate action advice section and different green accreditation schemes. Um, and obviously, um, another powerful and popular tool we have is through our grants funding. Um, and as I said, I think future climate based projects fall through through the grants kind of fall into three broad categories of capital projects, training, and then that public engagement side. Um, and we're also ex um, expanding the green criteria in our grants process um, to make sure that it's, it's a real priority. Um, and as well as doing our own projects, like we ran a, a culture at COP website during COP. Um, Fourth was the, was the communications. So climate is a relatively new area for MGS. So I think using our existing platforms is obviously key as MGS is a, a very established actor in the cultural sector um, alongside trying to develop new climate channels and audiences. Um, we recently launched a, a non-climate related campaign called Museums Ago, and it's proving quite effective. So I'd love to see something like that for climate and something in the works. Um, I'm aware I've gone over my time a little bit, but this is my last point, I promise. Um, 
So lastly, it was just this networks and partnerships idea and, and discussed throughout the last few months has been the need to establish professional networks and partnerships. Um, our work has found that museums want to know more about climate work going on, to, to be able to share good practice and make contacts with people who, who may know more than them. Um, and, you know, I wholeheartedly agree. Be, and it's something we're, we're, we're trying desperately to do because we can only make progress if we're shining lights on these issues and shouting about new ways of working and, and new ideas. And, and museums are the perfect place for this kind of innovation. So events like this, I think, are, are, are fantastic. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch kind of after this, um, I'd be more than happy to talk further about it. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. I've got so many questions, but if everyone could either save up their question or just pop it in the chat and then we can return to it um, at the end of the, ne of the next two presentations. So we're going to have a block of three just now. OK, so next up we have Alexander Goodger. Um, and his presentation is going is called Considering the Environment in Our Operations, Exhibitions and Retail Offer with a Limited Budget. Um, so Alexander is the manager of Dundee Transport Museum, and he's focused on developing innovative carbon neutral museums. He curated an exhibition at UN COP26 about Dundee and electric cars made from upcycled and recycled materials. And the exhibition has been shortlisted for Sustainable Project of the Year for Museums Plus Heritage Awards 2022. Alexander studied history at the University of Leicester and then completed his postgraduate studies at Ironbridge, the Ironbridge Institute of Cultural Heritage. Previously, he worked at Birmingham Museum Trust before moving to Cheshire to work as museum manager at Nanich Museum. So welcome, Alexander. We're really looking forward to your presentation. And uh, do you want to start by just trying to share your slides and we'll just make sure that works first off. Okay, super. Great. Can you see that there? That works, yeah. You just need to put it in presentation mode and we're set. Yeah. I'll hand over to you, thank you. Okay, so mine's very, uh, it's a pictorial presentation today. So I'll show you in practical terms. Um, uh, what we actually did at COP26. So the Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, ran a competition in 2020 um, to, for one of eight spaces at Glasgow Science Centre in the Green Zone, and we were lucky enough at Dundee Museum of Transport to get one of those places. So uh, we're an independent transport museum in, in Dundee, and we also own Maryfield Tram Depot. So it's a 1908 dilapidated tram depot and we hope that we can create Europe's first fully carbon neutral transport museum here in Dundee. It's a 4.5 million pound project. If we can get the funding to do it, we'll do that. So we tried to use COP26 as a launch pad to our funding initiatives and transport emissions are the largest contributor to climate change in the UK. This is kind of the timeline to it was quite a new museum. So we set up in 2014. In 2020, uh, we switched to 100% renewable energy and we cut our energy usage by 37% thanks to uh, uh, a report by Zero Waste Scotland. We hope to, by 2024, move to the new site. Um, and this, this is some of the changes that we made. So we got a free report from Zero Waste Scotland and we cut our uh, carbon footprint by 37% there. And those were the sort of four key things that we did just in terms of the building to our current building. This is not the new one. So installing the LED lighting, insulating the roof, bearing in mind this is a big warehouse. So it's very cold in there. Um, installing glazing over the front of house ticket counter, double glazing in the offices. And that was, this is pulled right from the uh, recommendation table from Zero Waste Scotland. So it gives us our payback time, 3.7 years. Um, so out, out, over the next five years, we should save around 10,000 um, pounds. But Museums Gallery Scotland gave us the funding in order to put those four changes into place. And this is, this is our kind of uh, carbon management plan. So it looks at the workspace itself, the materials we use, the cafe, the life cycle uh, assessments, the operational practices, um, reducing the consumption, switching to renewables, 
And how do we measure and communicate that? How do we reinforce that our exhibitions are sustainable? They're on sustainable themes. They use uh, materials that are sustainable. And these are the organizations that have supported us as well, particularly useful are Fit for the Future and the Climate Heritage Network. There's so many partners and case studies and organizations to speak to within that, um, that, that lent support during the process. So these were the themes of the COP26 exhibition. So the whole exhibition was focused on sustainable transport, electric cars, um, electric buses, and the history of electric cars as well. So green futures, climate justice, action for climate empowerment. And these were our audiences, uh, uh, public, museum practitioners, academics, COP specific audiences. Um, I think there was 30,000 delegates to the conference. And again, uh, engagement activities, community groups, schools, universities, museum professionals. And so in putting the, the exhibition together, the, we, we tried to make it as close to net zero as possible. So we tried to look for materials that weren't thermix panels and plastics. Um, and we tried to upcycle and recycle where we could. So we looked at some wooden panels and wooden backings. Um, and the backings we, we took from the exhibition were ripped from, I think they were from Arbroath Courthouse when, when it was replaced. And those were a few more ideas we had for that. For our takeaways, we used QR codes rather than paper for that instance. And that's Glasgow Science Centre, so that's us on, on the right, number five. And yeah, we just had a year to put this together. And we contacted every transport museum that we could in the UK and asked for interactives, for panels, anything they could do to help, any ideas, any objects. Again, there's the exhibition on the bottom right. So the, the two interactives that you can hopefully see there, uh, the one on the bottom left that was made by FIFEX Interactives using recycled components and parts made for other interactives. Uh, the panel on the bottom right uh, and the interactive are taken from the British Motor Museum. So we, we pulled everything off the front and we put a new panel on it made from Honeycore recycled materials with solvent-free ink. And it's the same at the top there. With the, with the core panels. Now, when we use Foamex panels or with our older Foamex panels or any, any aluminium panels, all we do is flip them around and then we get them painted or reprinted on the other side so we don't throw away any materials. Only it was a difficult exhibition to actually work with because I couldn't actually go to the space because it's right in the heart of COVID. So I only visited once during the, the, the whole curation process. So quite a big team. Uh, like I said, we worked with the British Motor Museum who gave us some of the upcycled interactives and also Glasgow Science Centre who helped us to build them as well. And that's some of the final panels as well. So the big question we were trying to address there was how, how can museums support the move to climate friendly technology and lifestyle? And each of the eight exhibitors tried to address one of these different questions within the exhibition. We've got a few definitions on there, the timeline. Don't know if you can see that, but on the bottom right, it just says a little bit more information about what materials we used in the exhibition. So we used the upcycled Fomex, the plinths were saved from scrap, solvent free ink, uh, and locally produced materials and local suppliers as well where we could for the, for the exhibition. And there's the exhibition again. So the collaborative we were part of is called Museums for Climate Action, um, funded and supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So if you want to see some of the eight um, ideas for reimagining museums for the future, you can go on this website. Um, the eight organisations and Arts and Humanities Research Council co-wrote and published the book that you can see on the bottom right, and that's available as a free PDF download. And that's just for an idea of, of scale. That's a 1967 Scottish aviation scamp. So that's Scotland's first prototype electric car. 
and uh, it was a dramatic failure a range of uh, I think it went about 18 miles so if you drove that to London it would take you 29 days but you wouldn't get there because the boot would fall off and it, it was a lithium battery inside it so you can imagine and that's it next to a Routemaster bus for scale and that's it on the way back on the way to uh, COP26 so it's done more miles on the back of that recovery truck than it has in its in its life that's one of the recycled interactives and um, that we use so the figures are correct as to 2019 and you can just spin the drum and it tells you about the sort of carbon footprint of your vehicle and the the whole interactive has been recycled from a, a, another display at the British Motor Museum we actually cartoonized the scamp and uh, we turned it into stock items we turned it into activity books for kids all made from recycled materials The uh, transport throughout time trail with a scamp on there as well. And then uh, we, we did the history of transport in a box as well. So audio guide of transport from the horse and cart right through to autonomous buses. And this is a good quote, uh, around 80% of, uh, of, of our carbon footprint in the UK comes from uh, consumption from all the goods we produce, use and throw away after one use. So bearing that in mind, we try to look at our shop and how we can, uh, in, in one of the poorest parts of Dundee and, and in Scotland, how do we make affordable products that people will buy and, and to replace some of the, the cheap stock that, that we have in essentially. And it was, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to do. And not many museums have found the answer to, to this. So this is the start of our, uh, us rethinking uh, our retail offer. So we've got wallets, phone cases, purses made from uh, recycled bicycle inner tubes. We've got locally produced jute key rings that are made from jute offcuts. We've got key rings made from wood rather than plastic. And we've got bags made from recycled lorry tarpaulin as well. Museums Gallery Scotland did a case study um, and also supported us for funding. If you want to see the exhibition, you can see it at Dundee Museum of Transport. It's there until October at the moment. And you can download this case study from Museums Gallery Scotland website as well. And we, the, uh, the Green Wheel Scheme um, was launched by the National Transport Trust and they They've put us as a, a case study for that as well, so that'll be rolled out soon. Yeah, so if you've got any more questions, uh, I normally do that presentation in about half an hour, so doing it in 10 minutes was tough. So if you've got any more questions, um, 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 you can email me or you can speak to me. Thanks very much. That was brilliant, thanks. I feel as though I absorbed a lot of information there. So thank you very much, Alexander. I've got lots of questions and I'm sure other people do as well. So maybe we could um, just save them up until after Vicky's um, presentation. And um, so finally, we've got um, Vicky Robb, who is Education Manager for the National Mining Museum, Scotland, where she has worked for over five years. And in that time, she has redeveloped the formal and informal learning and outreach programmes. Victoria has worked in the heritage sector for many years, including for Historic Environment Scotland, and prior to this worked in procurement. Uh, she has led the um, National, Muse uh, sorry, National Mining Museum Scotland in several notable projects, including the award-winning Year of Young People 2018 programme, and is currently su um, the successful Climate Beacon project partnership with the British Geological Survey and environmental artist um, Nicole Manley and I think we're going to hear about the Climate Beacon project uh, next because her presentation is entitled um, The Midlothian Climate Beacon Changing Perspectives. I'll hand over to you. Do you want to test your um, slides, Vicky? There we go, thank you. Can you see that? Oh, it's, just, it's just coming up. There we go. Yes. That's working. It just needs to be on presentation with my and we're off. Yeah, great. Super. Thank you very much. And hi, everyone. Um, so typical teacher, I'm going to ask for a tiny bit of interaction. Do not panic. This is not Blue Peter. I don't have arts and crafts at hand. All I'm going to ask is, could you simply put up your hand for me if you've ever held a piece of coal? 
how many people have got the cameras off just put their hands up for a bit so <laughs> thank you so yeah quite a few of you oh I mean, I forgot about the interaction thing. So loads of us have. Has anyone held, um, see, held seen a wind turbine? So loads of people have seen both. Well, four years ago, I asked our local primary five class the same two questions. Everyone in that primary five class put up their hands that they'd held a piece of coal. However, only a few had ever seen a wind turbine. Last week, I was working with the new primary five class um, in our local primary school. No one had held a piece of coal everyone has seen a wind turbine. So I've called our presentation today Changing Perspectives for a few reasons, but mainly because our museum's current mission is to preserve and promote Scotland's mining history and heritage for current and future generations. However, we're currently writing, our, well, we're in the process of implementing our new 10-year master plan, which will see some dramatic changes to the museum, not only in terms of physical changes to the museum itself, but also to the way we think. As such, we know the only way to preserve this past industry is to make it relevant for today's audiences. Fewer and fewer schools and people in general are talking about coal or mining history, but every single person is aware of the climate crisis and our changing needs to society. Therefore, we can no longer just tell the story of coal, we must tell the story of energy in Scotland. And um, as the first draft of our new mission statement says, we must embrace the legacy of Scotland's mining communities to meet the challenges of tomorrow. So that was a, a big sneak peek for everyone there. To set the scene for those who haven't visited us before, a mining museum is based at the Lady Green Colliery, our five-star visit attraction in Newton Grange Middlethian. The Lady Vic has stood the test of time and is Europe's best preserved Victorian super pit. It opened in 1895 and has witnessed the rise and fall of Scotland's coal industry. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've got most of our energy from fossil fuels. As we know, burning them releases greenhouse gases. While we no longer have any deep coal mines in Scotland and no coal power stations, coal, from extraction methods to burning for energy, has had a significant impact on our climate and our environment. It's only right, therefore, that this aspect is the museum has the largest burning engine, this huge engine. Sorry, Vicky, can I just interrupt? Sorry. Yes. It's, it's, there's a slight delay with your um, audio, and it's it's I can hear you and I can understand you, but sometimes it's really fast and sometimes it's really slow. I'm not sure if we can do anything about that, but I just wanted to flag to everyone that it is happening. <laughs> um, Sorry, thank you for letting me know. I'll take a pause between slides and see if that lets it catch up. Thank fine. you. <laughs> um, so trying to bring back a whole bit of that. Ah, yeah, the winding engine. So it was converted to an electric motor, but for a long time, it was supplied with steam from six Lanarkshire boilers photographed here. So we, while we do not actively burn coal on site or run any steam engines, we still need to talk openly about the environment, environmental impact of mining, the impact of burning fossil fuels as significantly the sustainability of our own buildings, organisation and site. Our response is ongoing and it has three main strands. I'm going to slow down, let the slide go. <laughs> so master planning, advocacy and education. I'm going to whiz by most of these strands, but wanted to note some of the steps and changes we have underway and are planning. Um, a huge piece of work that I already mentioned is our new 10 year master plan. It's a multifaceted document that is embedding environmental sustainability in our governance and management. While we work towards the long-term planning of the museum and site, we're making changes across the board now, such as recently, thanks to a grant from NGS, as Alex was mentioning, and we've updated our outdated and expensive halogen lighting to energy efficient LED lighting. We've undergone a full site energy survey and audit um, and changes in our cafe, such as only using recycled and recyclable packaging only. So advocacy and education are going to be the two areas that I focus on most. Heritage, education and partnership working are vitally important in the climate change narrative. We can allow people to study and interpret, interpret connections between the past, present and future. And through projects just like the Climate Beacons for COP26, we can help shape that future. 
So first up under my category of advocacy and uh, partnership working is the mid-loading climate beacon. So to touch upon what Lewis was saying earlier, the Climate Beacons project is a Scotland-wide collaborative project between climate change or environmental organisations and arts, heritage or cultural organisations to stimulate long-term public engagement before, during and after COP26. There were seven beacons set up across the whole of Scotland and Many Museum with the British Geological Survey and environmental artist Nicole Manley from the Midlothian Climate Beacon. Our mission was to create a transformative journey through the carbon cycle from Scotland's past legacy of fossil fuels towards a future of decarbonising, connecting local and international cultures through art and science. On the slide there, I've got listed some of the activities we've run um, and I'll be going into more detail in a few of them in a moment. And we designed these activities to gauge a wide range of audiences from children to adults there's been something for everyone. However, I should note that an important audience for us were actual mining communities themselves. In the lead up to the project, we spoke to our local communities and even ex miners um, to ask what they felt about the project, um, what would be the barriers for engagement, that sort of thing. And they advised us that they often felt excluded from climate change conversations. They often felt like events and folks uh, were like getting a telling off for being involved in an industry that they were quite proud to have been part of. Um, and that put them off finding out ways uh, that they could help make a difference. So by hosting events in the museum, they were in an environment where they felt comfortable in. And at every community event or activity, we took time to ensure that we spoke to people and that we listened. And we even created a transformation room in which um, to make people comfortable to do so in. Now, the main exhibition for the project, the Carbon Conflict to Climate Change Exhibition, was opened in November last year by the then Culture Minister, Jenny Ruth. The exhibition combines science, art, and connect human activity and experiences relating to climate change. Research and work from the British Geological Survey showed the different elements of climate change through geoscience themes and the effect it's having on our urban and natural environments. From BGS hydrologist and environmental artist Nicole Manley, the human experience of climate change were explored uh, through collage, sound, light, installations and clay sculptures. As we're working in partnership, it was important to us all to look at the full carbon cycle and reflect back on the mining industry itself. Um, and there was a large piece done about the research into geothermal energy and the potential of using X mine workings for this new source of renewable energy. Audiences could explore the exhibition for free. Well, the exhibition was aimed at adults and pretty very popular with younger audiences too. So we created a fun quiz and the boys on the left are doing it there. And at the end, as a well done, they all got a piece of wildflower seed paper to take home with them as a, as a wee prize. <laughs> So our main sort of community engagement aspect of the Middle and Climate Beacon was Weathering Earth. This was developed by Nicole uh, with a simple premise to create a clay sculpture while reflecting on climate change. The sculptures are then placed outside to be weathered by our wonderful Scottish climate. The clay, it's not man-made, it comes from the earth, and so by weathering it outdoors, it does return to the earth as well. Making the sculptures is hands-on, it's fun, it's tangible, and literally all ages can do it and have done it. Um, participants think about the impact that climate change is having. Um, a lot of people thought about their favourite animals, the impacts having them, their personal lives. Um, anything at all made and then outside for a day or two you saw in like sort of real time the tangible impact that the climate weathering is having as their sculptures weathered some of them hardened and broke apart some of them completely dissolved and disappeared altogether um, it's especially they went out during some of the storms like the recent one Eunice um, those sculptures were gone um, people across the whole of Scotland have participated and um, we've got over a thousand of the weather sculptures that have survived on display in our weathering earth installation I've included a few of my favourites here um, on, on the left hand side the one at the bottom was made by a family they were thinking about the polar ice caps melting so they made a glue but they wanted to think about the positives so they made a wind turbine but they were felt really proud their dad was one of the first bus drivers of the new Lothian electric buses so they've made their dad's bus in the background as well and um, the top right 
was um, she was inspired by that campaign. I think most of us have heard it. Um, Leave only footprints when you're enjoying outdoor in Scotland. So she made that one. And the top left was a gentleman. And actually, I think this is probably going to be one of the big things that stay with me. Um, he based his sculpture. It's, it's, sorry, it's a water jug, and it says "Save Water" along the bottom. And he based it on the Quran verse, um, and we made every living thing of water. Um, he's from Africa and he was reflecting that water has so many different meanings to so many different cultures. Some places too much water, too little water. So that was the piece. And he was hoping that it would actually gather water and it did. Um, I didn't include that photo, but it did actually gather water and hold water in it. So it was, yeah, it was really lovely. Um, as well as community groups taking part in schools, um, other beacons took part. This was by, um, commissioned, and artist Brody made this one. It was commissioned by the Inverclyde um, beacon. He used the recycled wood from the Glasgow Recycling Centre, as well as a piece of driftwood that he found to create this piece. Um, that it's got parts like fungus, lichen, um, mar uh, maritime invertebrate, as well as human body parts in it, and then it left put outside to be weathered. So these are stills from his film. The film is available on YouTube, as well as on the Weathering Earth website, which has got everyone's photographs of their clay sculptures on if everybody wants to have a closer look at it. Um, I mentioned schools also participated as part of the project, but the main engagement with schools was through our Net Zero Schools project. Um, this um, program, this workshop, was launched in October as part of the Midlothian Science Festival and engaged over 700 pupils in one month. As you can I was pretty exhausted, but it was amazing. <laughs> um, at the time, due to the restrictions, it took place digitally and saw pupils working through our resources to learn about energy sources, greenhouse gases, and ways to become net zero. They then worked in teams to create their own town, calculate its carbon score, and try and reach net zero. Um, the maps that we created were based on our map collection from the museum, and they had to even select the landscape. So they did have different options for landscapes. They had to choose the infrastructure, what facilities they felt were important, any rules. Um, the class on the left, they decided that you weren't allowed to drive to school. You had to walk or cycle to their schools. That was one of their town rules. Um, and then they pitched they, um, to each other and to myself, I am slightly visible on the screen there, um, about their towns and their ideas and if they managed and talked through their carbon score and if they managed to reach net zero. Afterwards, they took part in the Weathering Earth activity and then all the classes came out to the museum to visit, once restrictions allowed, uh, to visit the exhibitions and see their work on display, which was lovely. A few of the children proclaimed, look, we're famous, we're in an exhibition. So that was really nice. So moving on to our formal learning programmes, uh, which span nursery, primary and secondary, climate change and learning for sustainability are embedded in the Scottish Curriculum for Excellence. Will every primary school in Scotland cover mining history? No. Will every primary school in Scotland cover sustainability and climate change? Yes. Therefore, the most important element in creating our formal learning programmes is relevance. Everything we do must reflect our collection and our mission. It must be engaging for our intended audience and it must support the curriculum. I'm not going to go into the curriculum too much, but I will highlight learning for sustainability. What actually is that? Well, it's an approach to life and learning which enables learners, schools and their wider communities to build a socially just, sustainable and equitable society, including elements such as global citizenship, outdoor learning and learning for a better world. Perfect for interdisciplinary learning about energy and climate change across STEM, literacy, health and well-being and social studies. Um, I'll be giving some examples in a second so that will make more sense, but a key highlight is the role museums and culture can play in connecting these topics to places and people, building a deeper connection. So well, first up, this is our energy battle workshop. It was built upon the partnership project we worked with National Museum of Scotland on powering up. I will sort of pause myself there to point out it doesn't have to be climate crisis type activities. We're building in discussions about energy and our social responsibility across activities, resources and workshops. So this one here um, is hands-on experiments with wind, solar or hydroelectricity. This is the um, wind turbine activity here. And then we compare it directly to non-renewable energy, coal power um, and then renewable energy sources. We look at the pros and cons, even careers. Um, and at the end, pupils are put into teams to argue their case for their chosen energy source and create posters or full-blown full classroom exhibitions from their learning. From this project, we've seen improved problem solving and reasoning as a result. 
this next one here, possibly my favourite because um, I created this one at the start of lockdown a couple of years ago now. Um, and since then, it's been used by classes across Scotland, England and Wales. The concept's really simple. Coal is a reliable but non-renewable source of energy. It is mined from the surface and underground. So pupils are given two cookies, their land and their mining equipment, which is toothpicks. So they have to explore mining techniques such as open casts. Are the chocolate chips coal easier to mine from the surface of the cookie? They have to draw around the cookie. And once the chips are mined, they have to put the waste, the bing, back together um, without the chips in it. Again, exploring that concept of environmental impact without screaming it in their faces. Uh, costs, we bring in some maths there. They have to calculate how much profit, um, how much land wastage from the coal extracted against loss, um, I guess like mining equipment, um, broken toothpicks, for instance, that sort of thing. It's tangible, it's visual, and it's fun. I'm going to skim past this one, but I just wanted to highlight how important outdoor learning is, especially as in Scotland in particular, many of our uh, ex-mine workings have been redeveloped, um, and a lot of them um, are really important green spaces in our communities. Um, I agree. Um, if you want to find out more about outdoor learning, I couldn't recommend Outdoor Journeys by um, Dr. Simon Beams more from the University of Edinburgh. Um, it's, it's a great one. That one they are pictured as our mining mini beasts. No mining involved, just looking at some bucks. <laughs> Um, so this one's a bit different. It took place a couple of years ago, but we're hoping to restart it soon. Y2K is a youth, uh, is a sorry, community-based youth charity working with disadvantaged young people aged about 11 to 18, many of whom do not engage in a uh, formal education. It's a youth-led project called the Mayfield Explorers, which really aim to develop a sense of place in the young people and therefore reduce vandalism and fire starting. We ran skills development workshops, including photography, map reading, um, archival usage, local history tours, and even arranged site visits. So pictured here, this is uh, the old East House's colliery, and a lot of the young people involved in the project would gather at the back of those woods to have parties, to start fire, vandalism, um, and no, none of the young people pictured here knew this used to be a coal mine. Um, and we also added an intergenerational working, so we arranged to meet ex-miners and people in the community, and the young people decided they wanted this to run like Sky interviews between them, which was really nice, and then they made blogs about what they found out. This project might not seem like it's related to climate change or mitigate, mitigating the impact of industrial heritage, but it is. We are providing information and context for their social responsibilities. During activities, the young people recreated historical photographs as seen in the last slide. They asked questions about why there are no coal mines anymore and why things have changed. They drew their own conclusions about the impact mining as an industry has had. They began to care about their local places um, and local history, as Tilton says, through interpretation, understanding, through understanding, appreciation, through appreciation, protection. Vandalism dropped. Fire starting by those involved in the project stopped completely. Simply put, they care, therefore they are now engaged in protecting it. All the young people um, also achieved wards, um, which I have to say was a really, a really important bit because it gave them a sense of achievement as well out of the project. So looking to the future, um, thanks to one of the grants Alex was just describing there, we are going to be reopening our energy lab in a new green zone. The energy lab houses one of the first prototypes of harnessing tidal wave um, energy came from, actually even the porter cabin came from the <laughs> Edinburgh University, and it will be opening up alongside a new biodiversity area in our play park and an engineering and energy interactive zone. So we hope that will be opening in early 20, uh, 2023. So it is an ongoing process. I've whizzed by a lot of things there um, and we know we've got a lot more work to do, but through our master plan, partnership working and education program, we are changing perspectives and fueling the next generation of uh, decision makers. So thank you all very much for listening and apologies for talking so fast. <laughs>